thank you very much for inviting me. I usually like to stand and jump around during lectures, but this seems to be rigid like capitalism, so I can't move it at the moment. Uh, so I will speak uh, sitting down. Uh, the title, as uh, Sasso says, is uh, The Euro Crisis is a Crisis of Capitalism for this lecture. I could add, really, that it's the Euro Crisis is a crisis of capitalism, not a crisis of the Euro. And I think that that sounds rather simple, but if you think about it, what it's saying is that when we look at the question of what is facing working people in Europe and the Eurozone in particular, and in Slovenia at this very week, uh, the crisis appears to be something to do with the Euro institution, but behind that, if we just look at the Euro institution as the reason for the mess which uh, working people are having to pay for around Europe, then we're missing out the much wider issue that it's really a crisis of the capitalist mode of production which has created this situation. And, uh, I think that's an important thing that this lecture hopes to bring home uh, in the course of what I'm going to say. Now, uh, that means its resolution, if you think about it, from that very simple statement, is the replacement of capitalism, not the end of the euro, or the replacement of the euro with something else. Um, and so in this lecture, I want to show how that is the case. The euro crisis is a continued economic slump in the eurozone area. The huge hardship that is imposed on the majority of working people, particularly in the so-called peripheral states of the eurozone, like La Slovenia, and that, but that economic slump didn't come because or just because of the nature of the Euro institutions. It came because of the failure of the capitalist mode of production globally that we've particularly had since uh, 2007 onwards. And it's had the worst impact on the weaker capitalist economies. But the slump is only partly a product of the policies of austerity which the Euro leaders have adopted uh, mainly the Franco-German leaders to impose upon, through the European institutions, upon the rest of the Eurozone and Europe in general. And across, not without, outside the Eurozone, in where I come from, the UK, where the government is committed to an austerity programme. That slump or recovery, the failure of recovery, is only partly due to austerity. And all I'm going to argue in this lecture is that the alternatives presented on the left, uh, theoretically, Basically, in, within the economic field, the ideas of Keynesian policies, of fiscal stimulus, of monetary stimulus, of devaluation of the currency, have, will do little and have done little where they've been applied to end this slump. So that one of the things about the Euro is that leaving the Euro is no answer for any single EU Eurozone member. It won't be an answer, because it doesn't really solve the underlying problem of the failure of the capitalist mode of production. And the euro remains under severe pressure and may not survive if this long slump, or depression as I call it, continues, and especially if there is a renewed global slump, which I think is a possibility over the next few years. But, and the reason for that, which I will argue in the lecture, is that capitalism is a process of combined development, using all the resources and trying to integrate further the capitalist system, but an uneven one. It doesn't produce a process of convergence, which is what the Euro institutions were hoping for, within a single currency. A currency. It's a divergent process, particularly in a period of depression and slump. And the Great Slump, or the Great Recession, has exposed the divergent uh, nature of capitalism and the inability and the real difficulty of Euro institutions and the Euro to hold together in such an environment. So what we have is centrifugal forces, both economic and political, which could still tear apart the European capitalist integration project, which is what the Euro represents. So let me take you through my reasoning. The Great Recession, which began in the beginning of 2008, is really was a Great Recession. Uh, if we look at the uh, figures here, we can see that uh, on a world basis, that includes all the countries, the major capitalist economies around the world, it dropped from, say, a 5% growth rate right down to zero and below. And of course, amongst the advanced capitalist economies, it went much further than that. We had a fall of over 3% in real GDP terms. 
that's, uh, if you go back in history, we can see that that's a really unprecedented event in the post-war period to have that sort of a drop. And, and that's why we can call the Great Recession very much similar to the Great Depression of the 1930s. And I would argue uh, worse than that, because the width and breadth of the impact of this recession was much greater than the Great Depression. The Great Depression may have been deeper, at least for a, a range of economies, the major capitalist economies, but the Great Recession of 2008-9 spread much wider across the world because capitalism, of course, has developed and integrated and uh, connected much more than it ever was in the 1930s. And the impact of that is clear that we can see, just see how the sharp rise in unemployment rate for the OECD, the advanced capitalist economies, was from a growth, or an unemployment rate which is not exactly low, of around about five and a half percent or so at its peak, doubling or nearly doubling up to over eight percent on average, higher for some countries than others. So that was the real impact of a failure of the capitalist production, that it could no longer employ a sufficient number of people, and its production had collapsed as well. Now. Uh, how did that come about? Well, the first thing to note, and I think I'd like to take the enjoyable opportunity of explaining to you, or describing to you, what uh, mainstream economics explained for the reason of the Great Recession. And the answer is, they didn't know. They had no explanation at all of why this would happen. If we take the official uh, economic spokesman, Alan Greenspan, as you can see from the quote, at US Congress after the event said, I'm in a state of shocked disbelief. I've been going on for 40 years or more with very considerable evidence that it was working exceptionally well, it being capitalism. But unless there's a social choice to abandon dynamic markets and leverage for some form of central planning, I fear that preventing bubbles will end out, turn out to be infeasible. And assuaging the aftermath is all we can hope for. So he's saying, in other words, unless we have a planned economy, which of course we shouldn't have. But if we did, if we don't have that, then we can't stop these fluctuations, these bubbles. All we can do is try to clear up the mess afterwards. Ben Bernanke famously said after the 2001 recession in a major speech that um, I would like to say to Milton Friedman, who was still going then, and Anna Schwartz, the two uh, uh, economists who wrote an explanation for what the, why the Great Depression took place. Regarding the Great Depression, you're right. The US had a Great Depression, but thanks to you, it won't happen again, he said in 2002, because now central banks need what to do. If they just pumped in money, there will be no Great Depression. Well, uh, Ben is still here with us, uh, but uh, that prediction certainly turned out not to be true. And of course, there was no, in, no uh, anticipation or forecast that anything was going to happen. The head of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, that's the regulator of American banks, said in July 2007, that's one month before the credit crunch began, the banks in this country are very well capitalized. In my view, it would be very, very surprised if any institutions of any significant size were to get into serious trouble. So we can see that the official Organisers of monetary and fiscal policy in America and elsewhere had absolutely no idea of what was going to happen and were completely complacent. Let's look at mainstream neoclassical economics. I've picked out the two most famous Nobel Prize winners I could find. Robert Lucas said in 2003 that the central problem of depression prevention has been solved. Capitalism through free markets, Deregulation, privatization would no longer have any more crises or depression. Eugene Farmer, the Nobel Prize winner for the efficient markets hypothesis, which is that markets are efficient, and if you leave them alone, they'll be efficient. We don't know what causes recessions. We've never known. Debates go on to this day about caused the Great Depression. Economics is not very good at explaining swings in economic activity. Well, that sort of economics is not. Um, which brings me to the Keynesian view. I love doing this. But Paul Krugman, who is our doyen of uh, Keynesian economics now, <coughs> and other Keynesians say, don't take that view. Keynes did not take that view. There are flaws in capitalism. It's not a perfectly working system if it's left alone. 
and will avoid recessions. Quite the opposite, Keynes's whole uh, basis of, it, of his most famous parts of his economics is to show that that is a possibility, that it is likely. But what are the reasons? Well, Paul Krugman said that a market economy has many virtues, but it's shot through with flaws and frictions. He doesn't really go much further than that, although you can read his latest books to see if he spells it out more. And apparently, he seems to assume that what's wrong is not so much um, anything that uh, uh, the neoclassic are to say, that it's not perfect. Capitalism is a bit irrational. People make irrational and uncertain decisions, and that's what causes the swings and roundabouts of capitalist uh, progress. Uh, the view of Herman Minsky and his followers is that the flaw is actually right in the financial system, that there's a continual desire to have expand credit, to speculate in, for the banks and elsewhere in markets, and that powers an investment boom that eventually, like uh, the roadrunner in a cartoon, goes over the edge of the cliff and collapses because there's its uncontrolled expansion caused by speculative investment. Steve Keen, the modern Minskyite, uh, the Australian economist who's apparently developing a model based on Minsky uh, to explain capitalist uh, swings and roundabouts, says that capitalism is inherently flawed. Being prone to booms, crises and depressions, this instability in my view is caused by a financial system which it, it must, it's the characteristics of that system which cause these crises. That's what uh, Steve said. Now, there's certainly a lot of truth in the instability of the nature of the financial system and the banking system. And the Great Recession, at least in appearance, appears to be a result of a banking crash that began in 2007 onwards. But it's, uh, the Austrians generally take the same view, um, that the Great Recession is not, in well, their view, is a product of excessive credit. But all the reason for that is because of government institutions like the Fed, interfering and spending, ex, uh, expanding credit far too fast in relation to the market economy. So if government and in central banks got out of the market economy, there'd be no crisis. That's their view, which is similar to the neoclassicals, except that they think there is a crisis due to the, uh, an excessive credit crisis. Which brings me to uh, the Marxist view of the Great Recession. I'm going through this because I think it's relevant for us to, uh, to try and grasp the causes of the recession, because behind the causes of the Great Recession and the current picture will explain the crisis of the Euro, in my view. Now, I think Keynes grasped almost, in my view, the essence of the nature of crises under capitalism. He said, a more typical and often predominant explanation of the crisis is not primarily a rise in the rate of interest, which is what most modern Keynes and economists talk about, but a sudden collapse in the marginal efficiency of capital. In other words, in terms that I prefer, a sudden collapse in the profitability of capital investment. So Keynes is saying it's not, not a question of what Keynes like, Keynes is like to call the liquidity trap, namely that the rate of interest is too high in relation to demand and we can't seem to get out of uh, unemployment and equilibrium which is below full employment. But what causes that is a sudden collapse in profitability. If you read uh, Keynes's general theory and others, he starts, he starts off with this argument about profitability, but then quickly moves on to how to deal with the short-term problems of getting out of, of a slump and does not go back to discussing the causes. Now, my friend and colleague, uh, Guillermo Cardet, I think sums up very well what a Marxist view is. The basic point is that financial crises are caused by the shrinking productive basis of the economy. A point is thus reached at which there has to be a sudden and massive deflation in the financial and speculative sectors, which is what we had in the banking crisis. Even though it looks as though the crisis has been generated in these sectors, the ultimate cause resides in the productive sphere and the attendant falling rate of profit in that sphere. And that, in my view, is the essence of where we should start to look for explaining the cause of the Great Recession and the continued crisis that we're in at the moment, not only in the Eurozone and Europe, but else, elsewhere. And I think it's very uh, important that the Institute has decided to publish Capital of Volume 1 in, in Slovenian language because it brings home, if you read Capital again and perhaps people have the opportunity to study it more carefully, 
The Marxist theory of crisis starts in Capital Volume 1, not in Capital Volume 3 alone, where people generally look for a crisis theory, or in Volume 2. But because it describes the nature of the capitalist mode of production, which is based on value and a key role of profit, that production is for profit, not for use needs, not for people's needs, but for profit, and that out that profit is created by the labour power of working people and the appropriation of that into the private control of the owners of the means of production. And that the, means of, the owners of the means of production start with money and they want to accumulate more money, so the process of accumulation of capital in the, all its forms, starting with money through to the production process, into a commodity and back into money again, is what is described so clearly in Volume 1. And out of that comes Marx's law of the tendency of rate of profit to fall, because that process is flawed. It cannot continue because it eventually produces a fall in the ability to maintain and sustain profitability in relation to the investment that capitalists have made. And that's when and a crisis will then appear over a period of time, particularly when the rate of profit falls to the point that extra investment by the capitalist actually leads to a fall in the mass of profit. And the evidence shows in the Great Recession, it's just precisely when the mass of profit fell in the US and elsewhere that we begin to see the decline in investment and then the collapse of, the, of production in general. So let's get on to the data. I use the US rate of profit as the best example, the biggest capitalist economy, one which still is dominant in, in uh, the process of capital movements around the world, despite the rise of, uh, of uh, economies outside of the advanced world, like China and India and elsewhere. Um, the US economy is both the biggest in terms of uh, uh, production, but not particularly in finance capital as well. And there are three phases in the period that I've started from 19. 65, I'm not going into how I get to a rate of profit that starts at 27% and goes down. Um, Marxist economists are arguing continually in papers about how they measure this. I'm not going to do, you can ask me later. But the argument here I think is pretty common to any form of measure. We get a, a crisis period in capitalism from the mid 1960s down to 1980s, where the rate of profit in the US falls fairly sharply and consistently downwards. And those of us like myself who remember that period, because I was about your age in that period, that that was a period of revolution and struggle and crisis again for uh, working people and also a, a, a major crisis for capitalism and how to sort it out. Then we, from the period from the early 1980s up to 1997 in the case of the US, we have an upswing in the rate of profit. This is the neoliberal period where the Great Recession, or recessions of 1974-5 and eventually 1982, create the position where profitability rises through higher unemployment, through privatisation, through the destruction of trade union rights. I'm sure you're all aware of these things, but you can see a rise in the rate of profit as a result. But that peaked in the case of the US in 1997, and then in the subsequent period, which I would doubt, we're now in a period, a depressionary period, of falling rate of profit relatively, still relatively little in the fall of the rate of profit, but clear, in my view, clear, from 1997 till now, we have had a declining rate of profit over a period, with ups and downs, as you can see on the graph, in the case of, of the US. And across the whole period, there is a secular decline, which is the black line. So we can discuss, that, if you wanted to, a bit more about that. But the implication here is that there are three periods, and the most important implication for the discussion of this lecture is that since 1997, the US and, and other capitalist economies have had a decline rate of profit. This fits in with Marx's view that it's the rate of profit, the profitability of capital, which is crucial to understanding whether the crisis is going to take place and the form that it's going to take place. And I did uh, an analysis of a world rate of profit. I looked at uh, the major capitalist economies and I included some of the new ones, India, Brazil and others, and came up with a world average. It's a little crude, but it's a weighted average of that, of stock of capital and profit. And you can see the blue line shows you that the world rate of profit was doing a little better in the neoliberal period as these economies grew and emerged, the emerging economies, 
than the G7 average and continue to rise when the G7 average peaked in the really about the early 90s. But the world rate eventually also peaked around the mid 1990s and has been at least not rising anymore, if falling a bit. And the gap between the two is also wide. The crisis is much more severe in the G7 or the advanced economies. But there is clearly a change from the mid 1990s, the late 1990s, in the rate of profit. And that implies that the crisis that we're now in started, it had its underlying cause, and this turnaround in the rate of profit for the world in, in the mid to late 90s. I had a quick look at Italy on its own. I can tell you where I get this data from later, so you just have to believe me. But um, the, Italy's rate of profit, which every country's rate of profit is a bit different, obviously. We don't really have a world rate of profit because we still have barriers for labour and capital mobility, so we don't have an integrated world capitalist system in that sense. But Italy's rate of profit went up pretty high during the neoliberal period, and, but, only, but then stopped around 2001 and the recession of 2001, slightly after joining the euro, and it had dramatically fallen since. So that, uh, you can see that some of the more the weaker capitalist economies, even large ones, Italy's a weaker capitalist economy, even if it's a large one, was suffering even more uh, in the period after 1997 than the US and others. I had a look at data, and I'm going to kind of get data back to 2007 that's really worth anything, on Slovenia and other of uh, the major economies. I compared Slovenia, Italy to the Eurozone average to Japanese rate of profit, to the UK's rate of profit in the US. Now, this is indexed so that you start with 100 at 2000, where the rate of profit, everybody's rate of profit is fixed at 100 in 2000. You can see what happened in the period. So for two more years, most people went up a bit more. Uh, as the, the boom continued to 2007, if we take the US, which is the light blue line, that wasn't the case particularly for the US. But it, it slipped, everybody went down into 2009 in the, the bottom, and sometimes in the case of Slovenia, and really, it went even further down into 2010, while others were beginning to recover. If we take the Eurozone average, which is the uh, sort of darker brown line, we can see that the Eurozone average peaked in 20, 2007, about 5% above where it was in 2005, slipped down to 15% below where it was in 2005, and it, then it's been sort of struggling along, and has not recovered to the levels before 2007. In fact, of all those countries listed there, only the US has got its rate of profit back above where it was in 2005 or 2007. All the European and Japanese as well European Eurozone average in the UK, they've not got back, they're struggling. The UK is actually slipping further. And as for the very small capitalist, tiny capitalist economy like Slovenia, the situation is dire in terms of profitability. Why is this? Well, um, I'm going to argue that if we look, this is the US rate of profit by sector. And I want to, I, the reason I want to do that is I want to show that underlying the process of the overall rate of profit is what is happening to the rate of profit in the most in the productive sector of the economy that is re where labor actually produces new surplus value excluding the financial sector if we look at the corporate sector in the US just at the non-financial corporate sector which is what NFC stands for so we're, we're not looking at the banks we're not looking at real estate, we're not looking at all the financial institutions, we're only looking at what we call proper productive companies in the US. That's the red line. But the rate of profit in the US for the productive sector has really done, has continued to decline. You could say from the neoliberal period from 1980 to 1998, it sort of stabilized or rose a little bit. Uh, and, but it's been struggling at fairly low levels, around about 15%, for a long time. What has kept the overall rate of profit up for the US during the neoliberal period was only after 1992 when the financial sector rate of profit began to rise quite sharply in the great credit boom, which began in the 1990s and onwards. So that we can see that if we strip out the effect of 
the great financial and credit boom from the 1990s, the underlying productive profitability of US capitalism is poor. And that eventually decides the issue when we get to the, the Great Recession. Now here I've got, in the green line, the share of overall profits that uh, the US corporations made that went to the financial sector. So you can see that share generally has been rising, but particularly took off from the early 1990s. While the blue line shows investment by US corporations on a annual basis, the growth of that investment. So into the productive investment taking place, it was declining from a peak of, 10, of about 12% growth in the late 1970s, down to where it is now, to 2 to 3% a year, is the net investment growth of the US corporations. And yet, the profits of the financial sector have continued to be very high and increased sharply during the credit boom. Of course, they slumped during the recession, as we can see quite sharply, but they're still on very high. So we have low profitability from the productive sector of US corporations and increasingly poor growth in investment uh, in real assets like equipment, factories, uh, new technology, and so on. The US economy is decaying because this profitable sector, is, its productive sector, is, no, is not, not improving its profitability. And until it does so, US capitalism will remain with a low growth trajectory. At least that's my argument. In fact, they need to restore profitability. The capitalist solution to the crisis is a restoration of profitability. There is no other solution. It's not a question of spending more from government to get wages up. Quite the opposite. It's not a question of employing more people if it's not profitable. It's a question of getting profitability. This mode of production we have is not based on improving things for the majority of people or for labour. It's a question of increasing profitability. That's the nature of the process. If you don't get that, you don't get the other things. Investment, employment and so on. How do you get profitability up? The only way is to cut the costs of the advanced capital, the capital you're advancing. Reduce the advance, the cost of that capital, and you can get profitability up. Even if it's a smaller total amount, if the profitability is higher, then the process of growth can, I mean, investment can convey can commence again. And there are three ways that the capitalists look to do that. That is to reduce the cost of labour, get rid of your labour force, reduce its uh, wages, get the cost of variable capital, as Marxist definition would be down, reduce your cost of your capital equipment, invest less, write off the stuff that doesn't work, bankrupt companies which have got a lot of old-fashioned techniques or in industries which don't, aren't profitable anymore, to reduce the cost of your constant capital as well. And also a factor which is very important in this current period is to reduce the cost of your debt or the size of your debt. If you have borrowed all this money to grow in the past and you're left with a huge burden of this debt to be paid to a, a, the finance section of capitalists, you need to get rid of this debt also before you can begin to improve profitability and grow. If we take cutting constant capital, as you can see that the investment rate as a percent, well, the investment as a percentage of GDP has been declining steadily, but particularly during the recession it collapsed. Investment has been cut back in order to try and raise profitability. You can see that if you look at the data fairly closely, that Yes, growth, uh, G, G7 investment as a percentage of GDP fell from about 24 to 21 between 1980 and 2000. But the biggest fall has been after that, when profitability in the, in the G7 economies declined. So capitalists started to reduce investment in order to try and restore profitability. That's one thing they did. The other thing is to reduce your labour force, your cost of labour force, increase the reserve army of labour, as Marx would call it, get rid of labour it's costing too much and it's not generating the surplus value that you require. And we've seen that particularly in this recession. A very sharp rise. But in each recession you see that. In the 1980 recession it jumped from 5.5 to 8%. In 1990 recession 
from a similar figure up to about seven and a half. 2001 was relatively moderate, but this great recession has seen a very sharp rise in unemployment, reducing the cost of the labor force or variable capital. That's particularly the case in the weaker capitalist economies. Here's unemployment in the Eurozone during this period. We can see that uh, from when the crisis, uh, the slump began in 2008, a dramatic rise in unemployment in the Eurozone amongst the weaker capitalist economies within the Eurozone. The Eurozone average is up, but it's not anywhere near up as much as Slovenia, Ireland, Portugal, Spain, Greece, where capitalists there have had to make a much sharper cut in their variable capital costs in trying to get profitability up. And the other factor is debt. Here is a, uh, an estimate that I've made of the total amount of global credit in the world as a percentage of GDP. Now, up to 1995, you had that trajectory of growth in global liquidity to GDP. If it had continued that trend, the red line would have gone on like that. But what actually happened was there was a massive increase in credit to GDP, what Marx calls fictitious capital, all forms of debt and other forms of financial instruments in order to create faster uh, re re return on, on capital and, in, and profitability. So global liquidity to GDP rocketed from 150% in, in the mid-1990s to nearly 400% at the peak of the credit boom. There has been deleveraging taking place. The capitalists are trying to lay off this debt, get rid of this debt. Uh, we know that because the banks have been closed and the banks have been reduced in their size in order to do that. But there's still, still quite a lot of leverage or liquidity left in the capitalist economy. They haven't achieved the task to get rid of that cost of debt. And in fact, if we look at the uh, Japan, Eurozone, uh, Europe, and the US, G3 as I call them, debt to GDP continues to be very high. This is all debt. This includes public debt, not just the capitalist sector debt, but all debt remains very high. So what's happened is a lot of the debt which banks and corporations and households have had has been shifted onto the state, as we know, and the public debt is rocketed, and the overall debt figure remains very high. So it remains a huge burden upon the ability of the capitalist economy to restore profitability and grow again. That, that problem has not been solved despite five years of this depression. If I just look at uh, Corporate debt, which is the capitalist part of the debt, non-financial corporate debt, we can see with the blue line, European corporations have gradually been increasing their debt to GDP. They have been borrowing more to try and keep their economy going, particularly from the mid-1990s when profitability started to decline. Japan, which already entered a period of, of crisis of profitability back at the end of the 18, 1980s, has gradually been trying to deleverage. Japanese companies and banks have been trying to get, uh, get rid of their debt, but particularly the companies also, and they've just about got down to levels which were existed be, uh, before the great bubble uh, in the 1980s. Uh, maybe that's a sign that Japan has at least achieved, the Japanese corporate sector has achieved that target. As for the US, they don't have such a high debt level, but even so, it continued to move up from the mid-1990s and hasn't really changed much in the recent recession. And of course a lot of that debt, particularly bank and household debt, has been shifted onto the burden of the taxpayer across the world. And this is the public debt to GDP, the state debt to GDP in the advanced economies. During the World War II and World War I, massive increase as states uh, and governments borrowed in order to carry out the war and armaments program. Then they got rid of that with growth coming back and shifted that burden and laid and ripped, wrote off a lot of that debt uh, into the private sector. But we can see the gradual rise from the, during the neoliberal period of public sector debt as people, as the weaker economies tried to keep their uh, growth going even when profitability was not so good as elsewhere. And then the massive sharp rise during the recession. So the sovereign debt crisis, which is supposedly the euro crisis, is a product of the decline in the rate of profit in the capitalist economies the switch to increasing the credit levels of debt in the private sector and in banks across the world, and then finally, when the crisis came, to shift it onto the public sector and the taxpayer. And that's what we see. The dead weight 
of this debt still holds down the productive sector of the capitalist economy. And I got this from somebody else, I can't remember where, but um, we have along the horizontal line, private sector balance sheet stress. So that's looking at the private sector's level of debt, that's household and corporations, and that how much that debt is hitting their ability to boost revenue and profitability. And against that is the growth that those particular economies have achieved since the crisis began in 2008. So the more stress you've got on your debt, on your balance sheet in the private sector, the less growth you've achieved since 2008. So the dead weight of debt sits upon growth. And we can see the peripheral Eurozone economies like Portugal, Ireland, Spain are the ones that are right down that end of the spectrum. Those that have less stress on the corporate sector from debt, like Germany and Slovakia, have had relatively better growth, although you can see it's not dramatic. You can see where Slovenia is in that picture in the middle, that it has quite poor growth, negative growth, even though its private sector debt is bad, but not as bad as the peripherals. That suggests that the smaller capitalist economies suffer even more, even with that level of stress. Now, what is the solution to this crisis that capitalism is in? And I've looked at, uh, very briefly, the Keynesian solutions, which are presented to us. We have, a, in my view, a crisis in profitability, leading to a collapse in the capitalist mode of production, production and investment, and consumption and employment. The Keynesian solution is to start at the other end. We don't start with what's profitability. That's where the capitalists have started. That's what their program is. Keynesian start with the fact that there's unemployment and people don't have jobs and wages are down. So therefore we need to create unemployment, we need to boost wages, we need to make it easier for capitalists to employ more workers and to pay them more in order to get consumption going and that will get the economy going. And the first thing is, that, uh, is to cut interest rates. Interest rates are too high in this environment. It causes an unemployment equilibrium, it's not at full employment. So let's take interest rates down to zero. Eurozone short-term effective rate is at zero. This has been at zero and a very low level since May 10th, 2009. You can see the dramatic fall. So right in the middle of the recession, that's what the policy was adopted. All agreed that was necessary. And the result has been, has there been a recovery in the Eurozone? No. The other argument for Keynes is that Crisis is not a crisis of profitability or investment, a crisis of a lack of consumption. That uh, workers' consumption has collapsed and that we need to right that by some means. But if we look at the data, household consumption to GDP hasn't really collapsed. If you take the US red line, US household consumption is 70% of GDP. Now, I've looked very closely, I think I can see a slight dip in 2008, but actually not really. No, there's nothing there. It stayed more or less the same. So if consumption was the a collapse in household consumption was the cause of the crisis, then it doesn't appear to be the case in the US. And in the case of uh, Europe and Japan, similarly there's little evidence that it's done anything. Consumption in the Eurozone is now beginning to suffer a bit because it's now been in three years of major crisis and slump caused by investment and growth. But and unemployment remains very high. But not really. You can't say that that is the explanation and therefore that's where we need to look. So that brings to the question, well, if uh, the private sector isn't spending and the households are not spending, we need the came to say, let's have government spending. Now, uh, there's a much debate amongst economists about how effective government spending would be in this process of, uh, in this situation of slump. And uh, I did a quick analysis, there's a number of others you can look at, but I looked on the, the upscale shows the average rate of real GDP growth since the slump came to an end in 2009, and along the bottom, horizontally, the change in government spending as a percentage of GDP since we got to the bottom of the slump in 2009. And if we do that as a scatter graph, we find that most countries actually have had some growth since 2009. But all, virtually all of them have had growth while cutting government spending, the GDP. So that doesn't appear to be a successful policy 
in the opposite. If you look at the other way around, which countries have spent more since 2009 as a percentage of GDP in government spending? Well, there's about four, I think, there. One of which is Slovenia, actually. Uh, Japan has spent the most, way out on the end of it. Has Japan grown since 2009? No. Has Slovenia grown since 2009? No, the opposite. I've left out the other two dots. But there is no evidence that government spending on a capitalist mode of production would have produced the result that the Keynes hoped for, at least on that data. The other, the fourth method of at least an individual country getting out of this crisis is to devalue its currency, take advantage of everybody else, what is called the beggar thy neighbor policy, uh, we'll devalue, we'll get our exports much cheaper than anybody else, and then we can take bigger market share in world markets and we'll grow out of it through exports and the rest of the world can go to hell. Now, that solution, which um, obviously Keynes didn't necessarily adopt because he said we needed a, an international agreement, Bretton Woods type thing, to work this out, how currency should go. But anyway, some countries opted. Now, the argument often we get in where I come from in the UK is that the reason that what's wrong with the Eurozone is that they're stuck with the Euro and nobody can devalue. And that uh, they're, they, they, they've all got one currency and they're London with it. So our UK government introduced austerity and devalued the currency by 30% during the crisis. Well, look at the results of real GDP growth since 2009 in the case of the UK, which is the blue line, in the case of the Eurozone, which can't do value, or in the case of the US, where the dollar is probably at least the same as where it was, if not higher. The result is that devaluation has not helped the UK economy to grow faster than the US or the Eurozone. So at least on that evidence, devaluing the currency, even in one currency, a country does not solve the problem. This is a complicated graph and I don't expect you to read it from there. But the gist of it is this. Marxist view is that none of these policies will work unless they increase profitability. That the Marxist is looking from the point of view that the process of the capitalist mode of production starts with profitability and the ability to increase that. So, on the left-hand side, if the state starts to spend more money, and even if it finances it by taxing the capitalist sector rather than the labour sector, all, and therefore consumption rises, actually we can show that the rate of profit will fall in that environment because higher wages and higher consumption will squeeze profits, not drive profits up, and therefore profitability will fall, and that's uh, the result of just doing that. Now, on the other hand, if the, gov if the state starts to spend money on just investment, not, not just redistributing from uh, capitalists to workers in wages, but actually tries to increase investment, through spending money by handing it to the private sector, that could raise the rate of profit, but it depends on what happens to the process within the capitalist sector. Does the organic composition of capital rise, in which case profitability will fall because you're investing more in new uh, technology compared to labour, or the opposite. So it's not certain that even government spending in investment will produce the rise in profitability, and if it doesn't produce the rise in profitability, then the crisis will not be resolved. This uh, model, which uh, is called the Marxist Multiplier, was developed by Guillermo Calciedi, and he and I are going to uh, just about to publish a paper which will go into this in more depth. Because what we want to present here is why uh, Keynesian policies fall short in a capitalist mode of production, because they do not recognise that the key question is not a fiscal multiplier that increases spending, but a multiplier that can increase profitability or otherwise. And that's the crucial question for the resolution of the crisis. And governments, really, on the whole, can do little in this environment. It's up to capitalism to destroy our lives before we get profitability up. Which brings me to the question of the Eurozone, the crisis and the single currency. Now, Capitalism is an un a combined and uneven development process. It's both a process where we bring the resources together to ma maximise the ability of labour power to produce new value. The further the integration of, uh, there's a drive towards integrating and, and spreading the capitalist mode of production around the world and integrating it 
a globalised system, but on the other hand, it's a totally uneven development. It doesn't take place in a planned and balanced way. It takes place with uh, larger capitals competing against smaller ones and defeating them. Uh, so the process is uneven. It might be combined, but it's uneven. And that, that is the core, at the core of the flaw in trying to have an integrated Europe based on a single currency under a capitalist mode of production, a united Europe under a capitalist mode of production, is always under tremendous stress and a, uh, with a brisk breakup because capitalism is not an even process of development. So we have a Eurozone which is many economies with one policy on inflation, one interest rate for the short, the short end set, and one currency. And we have a monetary transfer mechanism which tries to equalise as any imbalances that exist in the monetary system. Because if they can't, then the euro won't hold together. But we don't have a fiscal transfer mechanism for, which will cover both financial and external imbalances within the eurozone. It's a halfway house to full integration on a federal model like the United States or Australia. The eurozone member states are a halfway house in that process. Been, since 1999, that has worked for a period of time, but the Great Recession and the slump that's followed has pushed the stress ability of that Eurozone institution to stay together to the limits. And we can look at the nature of the uneven development, since we can see that if we look at the uh, rest, of, we look at that black line, that is the current, that's the current account balance of the Euro area GDP average. So uh, the red line tells you that Germany has done better as a percentage of Euro area GDP than the Eurozone average by some 2% of GDP a year since 2000. It had a current account surplus. It's in balance as in a surplus within the Eurozone average. And, but the GIPS countries, that's Greece, Italy, Ireland, Portugal, Spain, all the peripherals that are in trouble, they they're in balance, they run a wider and wider deficit. So that even in the period of growth of the Eurozone institution, the uneven development is taking place. And that also applies to the overall capital flows, the financial flows, the international investment position, the right-hand graph there, which shows that, again, the peripheral countries, their deficit, that what they owe to the rest of the Eurozone and to the rest of the world has dramatically increased relative to the Euro area average. While Germany's surplus, what they uh, have as assets, net assets against the rest of the world, has continued to widen. So the, the Eurozone project since 1999 has not produced the convergence necessary to withstand a major crisis like the Great Recession. It has left itself open to tremendous pressure. So the battle conver for convergence, which is the Eurozone project cannot work unless the weaker capitalist countries converge towards the stronger ones in the, so that European integration can take place, but capitalism doesn't really allow that. So that Estonia, which back in 1995 from this graph shows, was way down at the bottom there uh, in terms of its relation to the general average of the Eurozone 12 in 1995, compared to Germany up the other end, which is well above the average. That's the difference between the per capita GDP of these Eurozone countries. And what, what has happened we can see that the uh, that Estonia is way down there in its current account imbalance before the crisis hit Estonia. It had a current account deficit of well over 10% of GDP. It was unable to converge towards uh, Germany because of these huge Im imbalances. If we just look at GDP, we can see that. For a period from 2002 to 2007, Greece, Italy, Spain, Slovenia, were all growing faster than the Eurozone average. So they were converging a bit. They were beginning to converge towards the Eurozone average. But then the slump hit, and they went rocketing down. And I've just, you take the period from 2009 to now, they've remained negative, really, until very, uh, forecast, the forecast from the IMF is that they will go positive and start to converge, but we're not there yet. You can, this is an IMF figure. You can see the GDP figures between 2009 and 2013 relative to the Eurozone average for all these countries is negative. It's a huge loss. They're going backwards. The divergence is widening, not narrowing. The convergence is not taking place. And it's not taking place even with recovery from 2009 onwards. 
And a, perhaps the most clear example of the process that has been involved is what they call Target 2, which is the Eurosystem's monetary system. Now, if you've got a Slovenian Euro and you've got a German Euro, it's the same thing, I'm glad to say, in my pocket. I can go to Germany with my Euro and it's, it'll also work in Slovenia, even though it might have a different on the actual paper money, a different picture on one side. It's a euro is as good in Germany as it is good in Slovenia or Spain. That's the euro system. But if money is not flowing through, the capital is not flowing through to cover that, then the ECB has to intervene by providing Slovenian banks with sufficient euros to make sure that they can meet the demand for euros, because if they don't, then the Slovenian euro is not as good as a German euro and the euro system collapses. What that means is that German and surplus banks build up quite a lot of assets with the euro system and the ECB, which is the blue line, while all those in deficit and not getting any loans from the private sector are building up a big liability with the ECB and the euro system. So that, that shows very clearly the divergence that's taking place in the eurozone during the crisis. The pressure of divergence is increased. You can see after the up to the crisis, there was no divergence at all because the euro system didn't have to worry about that. If, if Slovenia run a current account deficit, it didn't matter because German capital would come in and elsewhere through the capital account to finance the banks to do that. So, but once they no longer wanted to lend and want to do the opposite, German banks, then the ECB has to step in and you get this huge wide divergence. This is, this is the pressure upon the euro system to maintain one euro for all these countries. It's just beginning to turn around in the last year, last six months or so. It's not as bad as it was, but it's still there. So we can see that in where most of the euro governments want to look at. The government deficits to GDP, the fiscal imbalances are also huge. Spain's fiscal imbalance is massive compared to the eurozone, and Germany's is better. So the pressure on the public sector is also there. The divergence also takes place there. And it's, it's highlighted by the fact that there is no fiscal transmission mechanism to sort that out. Now, Eurozone governments have been forced, kicking and screaming, into coming up with a bailout mechanism by which they can hand money over under very severe conditions to countries that can't meet their targets in order to bring about convergence. So they've introduced the EFSF, and now the European uh, ESM, ways in which they, they put, uh, the surplus countries have basically put up a load of money, put it in a bank and say, okay, you can hand it out to help the debt and deficits of the weaker countries under certain conditions, as long as they carry through a program of austerity over a period of time, and it's conditioned and it's limited and they've got to pay it all back, and that basically totals up to 8% of Eurozone GDP. That's the size. Now, in the United States, which is a federal capitalist economy, it's automatic process. If a state's in deficit, it automatically gets transfers from the federal government, from surpluses from other states, and the average fiscal transfer to the various states is 28% of US GDP every year, plus or minus. So you can see that there's a, a much higher level of fiscal transfer takes place than the Eurozone is yet committed to in order to, to maintain uh, and reduce the effect of these imbalances. So the US has an annual fiscal transfer of 28%, while Portugal is getting from the Eurozone a transfer of that size and, very, and, and, and downwards, much smaller than in each than the average that the US state gets in terms of trying to solve its fiscal imbalances. So although this money has been grudgingly handed out by the surplus countries, Germany and others, it's nowhere near enough in relation, relative to what happens in the US in terms of dealing with them when, when the state has a fiscal deficit. And there's a quick map here which shows that over 20 years, New Mexico has run a deficit on its fiscal transfer deficit from the federal government of 225% of GDP accumulated that. They just automatically received that because the United States is a United States. So if you want one federal republic and government and state system, 
and you want a capitalist mode of production based on one state, and you want one currency, then New Mexico continues to get funding from the other states through the federal transfer process. That it does not exist in the Eurozone at the moment. There are people within the strategies of capital who want that as a solution of federal Europe, and of course there are lots of others who oppose it. We're still in a halfway house. And that brings you to the issue, well, maybe you should just get out of the Euro, and that's been proposed by various groups, uh, particularly in the struggle in Greece, that that was the solution for Euro Euro people to get out of the Euro. One example often used is uh, Iceland, which has never been, not even in the European Union or the Euro. What was their answer? Well, they devalued the currency quite severely, and there are a number of other issues that they took. But did devaluation help the people to get out of that crisis? Well, this figure just shows that if you look at the red line, or the blue line, that the pre-tax wage income per taxpayer in Iceland fell by 20% in, in Icelandic krona terms, and even more if you measure it against euros, by 40%. It fell from 100 to 57.3, over 40% fall in the living standards of pre-tax wage income in Iceland as a result of devaluation. Yes, they got their exports up, they got their labour costs down, but at the expense of the living standards of Icelandic people. People don't, but they think Iceland solved their problem by doing this, but it's not the case. So, can austerity work? That's the alternative of the present governments. Their argument is, if we get unit labour costs down, in other words, get variable capital down and profitability up, we can then create an environment for growth. And particularly, maybe we can increase our share outside Europe by, if Greece may, may get its uh, labour costs down by reducing the living standards of the Greek people by 25 to 40%, then they were in the position not only to sell back to Germany, but perhaps outside Europe and so on. And ideally, maybe we should have the euro currency weaken against the dollar and elsewhere so they can take advantage. Uh, this is the sort of programme that we're getting. When we look at unit labour costs, well, Back in 2007, uh, you can see that Portugal had a 6.3% higher unit labour cost. That's the cost of employing labour for each unit of production was 6.3% higher in Portugal than it was in Germany. So although Germany has a much higher wage level, its productivity is so much greater that its unit labour costs were lower than Portugal's by 6.3%. What's happened after five years of austerity and the crisis in Portugal? Well, it's still higher in Portugal. In the case of Slovenia, it's even higher than it was. So Slovenia is even more unable to turn things around under the programme of cutting union labour costs and austerity. Greece, after three, four years of hell, has finally got union labour costs lower than Germany. It's finally, you could say, from a capitalist point of view, on the turn. So, the result, if, if Greece starts to recover and remains in the euro, then they can congratulate, capitalists can congratulate themselves if after giving the Greek people five, four, five, six years of hell, and probably a generation without work as far as youth, be, youth unemployment is concerned, they finally got an advantage competitively. Uh, elsewhere, you can see Iceland had a dramatic fall because it devalued the currency, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's recovering as well, even with those unit labour costs down. And I had a quick calculation. I looked at, from a Marxist point of view, the impact that can happen. What's crucial here, it's like the Marxist multiplier, is not just getting labour costs down, it's not a sterile cutting the budgets and the fiscal deficit, it's does profitability recover? That's the important thing from the capitalist mode of production. So I looked at profitability since 2009, and we can see that Estonia has had the biggest increase in profitability. And anybody who's been to Estonia will explain why, apart from massive unemployment and dramatic falls in living standards, they've got profitability up. And as a result, they've got a slight growth over the period of 2009-12. Now, Greece hasn't got its profitability up at all. And yet it's had no growth whatsoever. It's fallen by 5 or 6%. There is clearly a correlation between the ability to restore profitability since 2009 and growth. The Eurozone average is more or less not much improvement in profitability and still negative growth. 
So that's a crucial graph in a way for whether austerity is going to turn things round. Can profitability be turned round? It's taking an awful long time for capitalism to turn this around and they still haven't done it. Now, what's happened in Ireland and places like uh, uh, Estonia is one of the reasons they've got variable capital down and the labour force down is that the labour force is not there anymore. It's moved. Uh, we can see in Irish immigration has gone from around 30,000 a year uh, rate or 6% of the per thousand of population up to 20% of population. Massive increase in immigration. Irish young people have left Ireland and that's reduced the cost of the labour force and it's kept unemployment down even uh, lower than it otherwise would be. It's still high enough. That also applies, as you can see, to a lot of other countries, particularly the Baltics. Latvia has had a 700% increase in emigration. Lithuania has had a 400% increase in emigration. Spain, 200% increase in emigration. I haven't checked the Slovenia's figures, but that's an indication of one way in which the process, the mobility of labour has just gone to other parts where capitalism is a bit better. And that's helping. That's one of the ways the smaller ones on the peripherals have gone out. There's still a long way to go, as I said before. That still, prices in most of the Eurozone economies are higher than they were relative to Germany since 2008. Spain, Greece, Ireland, some of the peripherals have managed to turn things around, but the majority of not. Slovenia has still got a rise in its price level compared to Germany since 2008. So the, it's still a crisis for these smaller capitalist economies. So the, the turnaround from austerity or otherwise to profitability for the Eurozone is still there. The, the pressure is on and the people are fed up to the back teeth. Ordinary people have five years or whatever is it of austerity, of cuts, of reductions in living standards. People go to vote, they find that there's no party that's against austerity. They don't know who to vote for. Voting turnouts fall across the capitalist world, not just in the Eurozone. Look at Italy's in the latest election. This is the low, 70% is high by most capitalist standards, but it's still the lowest it's been since the Second World War in the case of the recent election, the unresolved election in Italy. Slovenia so seemed to me, look, I've just been checking, a little late in the crisis, but it's right here now, isn't it? Uh, that here is a small capitalist economy which has got the same problem as all the others. According to what I know, it needs five billion to pay back in debt by the summer of this year. It's not sure it's got it. It may well need to go to the dreaded Troika and ask for a bailout under the usual conditions of austerity, or it may come up with its own schemes like ILA, which is basically to uh, take all the bad debts, hand them over to the taxpayer and so-called bad bank, and leave the other banks, clean up the rest of the banks, uh, get rid of all the bad debts, hand them over to the taxpayer, and the other bits can be sold off in privatisation. That's one solution of the gentleman at the top. Um, solution of the lady at the bottom, I just got a quote from her the other day, economic growth and fiscal consolidation without hampering growth. Well, economic growth and fiscal consolidation without hampering growth, I'm not quite sure how that works. This is the kind of government that we should reform. Well, yes. Um, so we still need fiscal consolidation and we need growth and we need a government that's prepared to do both. Well, it's a task which I think is not going to be easy to achieve from the experience of the last five years. The future of the euro, seems to me, is a future which I remind you at the beginning of this uh, lecture was, depends on the future of capitalism, not on euro institutions as such. The forces of capitalism are both combined and uneven. There are centrifugal forces as well as those forces for integration. There are nations looking after their own national capitalist interests against the idea of having a European superpower that can compete against Asia and the US. The great Fancro German project was precisely that, to build a Europe, a, an integrated Europe which would be able to compete with the other powers. But if growth does not come back, and growth depends on profitability, then the issue of further integration or disintegration is still on the agenda for the euro. And in a way, it's not so much up to whether 
the Greeks leave the Euro in a, with a left government, or some of the peripheral countries do that. It's up to Germany. If Germany is prepared, as a, the major capitalist power in Europe, to shell out fiscal money to bail out under conditions for 20 years, many of these smaller capitalist economies, if growth does not return, then the euro will hold together. But is Germany prepared to do that? Well, we hear now that a party has been formed in Germany which uh, claims 25% support in polls for Germany to leave the euro. That will be the decision for the euro. And it may still come. What that depends on is what happens to the capitalist economy globally, not what happens in Europe. My view is that we're still in a long depression. The, the rate of profit that we saw beginning to fall in the major economies from the late 1990s continues to grind downwards. And further uh, process of uh, creative destruction is necessary in the value of capital to, to re reverse that. So we remain in a weak economic recovery. It means that the Eurozone remains fractured. and It's difficult to heal. And there's every possibility that we'll have another slump before the end of this decade which could create a picture very similar to the Great Depression of the 1880s, which will is necessary in order for capitalism to try and restore profitability. But another slump threatens to bring the whole of um, the Eurozone project to an end. So, in summary, my view is that when we're looking at the question of the Euro crisis, particularly as it affects Sabina and elsewhere, we should remember that it's really an underlying crisis of capitalism, and the euro institutions will survive other or not, depending on whether capitalism can restore profitability and enter a new period of sustained growth. And at the moment, the prospects for that remain dim. Okay. Uh, thank you, Michael, for this great uh, lecture. So now it's time for the debate. Uh, so if you have any comments, any questions, just uh, raise your hand, please. Um, you mentioned the current account uh, imbalances in the Eurozone. Is there a complete correlation between the current account uh, balance and uh, the rate of profit in one country, for instance, in the Eurozone? That's a strange one. Yes. I don't know. Uh, I don't think so. Um, because obviously the current account only deals with the external balances of any particular na nation state. Um, and what it suggests, I mean, it, it's, it obviously suggests that a country is not able to compete in world markets effectively, or in order to grow, it has to import a large amount of it that otherwise would be necessary in order to have a balanced level of growth. And if it runs a current account def deficit on a sustained basis, then it requires capital flows coming into the country in terms of either investment in companies or uh, investment in financial assets that that country's had in order to provide the extra funds to buy those, those net imports. And if you continue to have that sustained basis, that would suggest that that economy is weaker compared to others and is not in a position to compete in world markets. If you want to take the US, for example, before the crisis, it was continually running a sustained current account deficit. So does that suggest that US capital is weaker than, say, the surplus of capitalists like Japan and Germany? Well, yes, in a capitalist sense, it is. It means that they're, they're not as productive as they were. But the US can still live off its past. It can live off its predominant hegemony in, in the world capitalism that it's had for decades before. And that the dollar is the reserve currency of the world. People transact and hold their uh, reserves in dollars and their store of value still in dollars. So that there is a, uh, as they were, an accumulated uh, reserve for the, for the US capitalism, despite the fact that it's become relatively, weak, relatively weaker compared to Europe and Japan over the last 40 or 50 years, and in particular since the mid-1990s and the decline in the rate of profit in, in the US, it's been running a current account deficit, and still running a current account deficit. But if you take a smaller country like the UK, which is still a large capitalist economy, it also has had a sustained current account deficit. But it doesn't get the same sort of support from the reserve currency nature of the dollar. Its currency therefore comes under pressure. 
and actually its profitability, particularly under this crisis, has not recovered. So maybe there is a, a case for saying that those economies which continue to run a sustained, sustained current account deficit or a trade deficit and haven't been able to reverse that significantly during this crisis despite, would, would, it would suggest that also that they're weak and that their profitability is not recovering. Uh, yeah, you, uh, you provided a well-grounded uh, account of economic indicators throughout the uh, 20th century with, of course, profitability being uh, uh, the key factor. Now, uh, my question is, uh, what would be the role of uh, technology and innovation throughout, these, uh, uh, throughout this age? And the reason why I'm asking is because uh, the European political elites, before this crisis, uh, hampered their uh, ability of uh, providing proactive political projects uh, have uh, betted on uh, uh, this Lisbon era um, type of uh, consensus, which which has uh, which did bet, bet on this horse of innovation, which was uh, uh, purported to uh, both uh, uh, increase demand and uh, raise added value and perhaps even raise the quality of life. Now the question is, has this uh, expectation ever been uh, justified from? say, the Industrial Revolution onwards, and even then, if? <clears throat> it's, a, it's a big question. I mean, nobody can deny that the capitalist mode of production has led to a massive increase in uh, technological innovation and, and the expansion of productivity of labour. I mean, it is one of the features of the capitalist mode of production that Marx describes in Volume 1, in particular, and elsewhere, that uh, the Institute has just published that uh, capitalism is the most advanced and productive form of uh, economic organization that human beings have been able to achieve so far. But it's done so at the sweat and labor of the majority of people who do not gain the fruits of that. And also, and this is the other part about um, technology, is that the increase in that technology is partly to re reduce uh, the use of labour power relatively, or, and that, that eventually leads to a crisis in the capitalist system itself. So there is, a, on the one hand, capitalism is a progressive force in developing technology, and we've seen over over 200 years that process, and also. It is a regressive force in holding back the fruits of that and the development of its fullest potential of that technology for the majority of people. And the reason it's progressive, regressive is because eventually the increase in technology relative to the uh, employment of labor begins to grind down profitability within the capitalist system and that is the only modus vivendi of the capitalist system. Now, um, the Lisbon Treaty in a way expresses that contradiction. It says, on the one hand, capitalism wants to grow the productivity of labor and boost the, uh, uh, the level of production and living standards by the use of technology, and in some way, some integrated capitalist process where harmonized planning by European states will achieve this, on the one hand. On the other hand, it wants a free market. It wants uh, private ownership of the means of production. It wants uh, capitalists to make a profit. It wants uh, European Commission spends all its time trying to avoid uh, allowing states to do anything at all. Um, Nationalisation of the banks, apparently under the Treaty of Rome, is more or less excluded. You would be breaking the Treaty of Rome if um, you decided to renationalise banks that have been privatised. There is the, 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 the concept and the Treaty of Rome is for a free market system, and yet they also want an integrated process for the growth of technology. That's a contradiction that it cannot be resolved, and it's not being resolved in this slide. Okay, any other questions? Maybe I have one. So, uh, one question concerning the underlying theory uh, of your uh, explanation. So, uh, you basically go, uh, in your explanation, you go from profits to capital accumulation to investment and then to growth and employment. So you seem to be saying that uh, when the rate of profit is high, this will allow for a high rate of accumulation, which will lead to high investment, of course, and this will lead to growth uh, and employment. Uh, so basically a 
reverse picture of the Keynesian account. But uh, I mean, even though I generally agree with these dynamics, I just think it's probably a bit too simple to say that okay, the high rate of profit will lead to high accumulation, while the low rate of profit will lead to low accumulation. Because, for example, uh, Marx, in, Marx himself states in uh, Volume Three of Capital that. Uh, if uh, I know capitalists uh, are uh, in the context of a falling uh, profit rate, uh, capitalists will be basically induced to accumulate even uh, basically even faster, just in order to produce the same amount of profit as in the context of the higher profit rate. And uh, for example, if you go from uh, capital accumulation or from investment to growth and employment, of course, I mean if you have a increase in the rate of accumulation, and if, if you, for example, start with uh, Marx's uh, general law on capital accumulation as is developed in the first volume of capital, this of course, uh, which of course says that uh, if accumulation increases, this will lead to uh, increasing the demand for labor uh, power. So for example, if the uh, uh, rate of accumulation increases for 20%, this will also lead to 20% uh, increase in the demand uh, of labor power. However, this only is true if we presuppose that the uh, productivity of labor and the uh, organic composition of capital uh, remain constant, but they usually don't. I mean, if this uh, rise in accumulation is based on uh, relative surplus value extraction, and it usually is, this means that also uh, the productivity of labor increases and the organic composition of capital increases, but this also means that workers are displaced by machine and it can lead to basically decrease uh, into uh, decreasing the demand for labor power. So uh, I'm just wondering how would you comment on it? Who got that? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I think I, the way I would answer it, I'm going to answer this other, is that yes, um, I think what Marx, Marx says is not that the rate of profit causes directly the crisis, that actually the crisis comes when there is a collapse in investment. To call it an investment strike. I like that because it's a bit of a propaganda against the view that it's workers that cause crises by going on strike and you know, holding the country to ransom. Actually, it's the capitalists who hold the country to ransom by going on strike and they stop investing. But why do they stop investing? It's not because they've noticed that their rate of profit has gone from 12% to 11% and that's it. It's not, that's not happening. The process, it, that, the underlying process is that the profitability is being dragged downwards. And actually, as I says, in that period, they will actually probably increase investment for a period of time to try and compensate for that, because what they're after is the overall mass of profit to increase. That's the important thing. Uh, the rate of profit is the process that's going on underneath. So the point when capitalists go on strike is when they find that the profit they had in year one is actually lower in year two, so, and then and year three is going to be even lower, they think. So that's when they stop. And so if we look at the data, the, and I think Marx says this, and other people do, it's the, at the point when the mass of profit is no longer rising. We get to the point of overproduction of cap capital in the, in the strictest sense of the term, and that is the point of a crisis and when the slump begins. And then the process which we described, starting in profit, you go to investment, and for investment you go to employment, and for employment you go to income, and from income you, or con consumption. So uh, you get what I consider is the, the process of the, cr of the crisis in slump, in a Marxist sense, that we have to look, if you want to understand what's going on, yes, we can see that people have lost their jobs, and capitalists have stopped investing. Now, a Marxist would say, the Marxist economic view is, that is because the rate of profit has come to the point where the mass of profit this fall and, and, the, and the crisis begins. There could be lots of other reasons which cause that massive profit to fall rather than just the underlying cause, because each crisis is different. Keynesians, are not, Keynesians would say, no, what's happened is that uh, consumption's stopped and employment's gone down and therefore profits have gone down. They're going the other way and therefore the solution is to look at that end and that's why their solutions don't work because they're looking, they're not looking at the capitalist mode of production uh, and in fact, it's very difficult to see in Keynesian economics any real discussion of profit at all. It doesn't really exist. There's either investment and saving, and 
in heavy spending, if you like. There is no profit as such. It doesn't come out of anywhere in particular. And that's what the essence of volume one is, to show where profit does come from, why it's the key process that's involved in the capitalist mode of production. So the, sh the short answer is that once we get the rate of profit hits a level where the mass of profit starts to fall, then the crisis uh, begins. And that is, the, uh, that is the issue. When I'm showing the rate of profit, I'm, not, I'm just showing the underlying process of pressure upon the capitalist system, which then kicks off at a certain point. It could be triggered in a banking crisis, often is, when the credit is way out of line with the ability of the, cap the productive sector of the economy to support it. And that is expressed eventually in a fall in the mass of profit, and then capitalists make their decision. Okay, any other comments, any other questions? Okay, if not, I'd like to thank uh, Michael Roberts again. Bumba Sanche Torgwenda Silako, Vistus de Zune, Kupite, Chisvode, Prevode, Prve Knige Kapitala, Po Promociski Ceni. Zdaj pa zaenkrat zaključujemo, program se pa nadaljuje ob pol devetih, ko bo plesna predstavitev enega izmed brehtovih učnih komadov z naslovom Krep. Okay, we're done.